Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon everyone. Welcome to this Open Science webinar series brought to you by USM Library. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Chiramla, Senior Librarian at University of Science Malaysia. We'll be your moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome our special guests for today's webinar. There are three speakers from Utrecht University of Netherlands. Um, good morning, Dr. Judith, Dr. Daphne, and Mr. Felix. How are you? Hopefully, everything is going well and smoothly on your side. We can't wait to listen to your presentation today. We would like also thanks to all the viewers uh, live from our YouTube channel and Facebook page. I can see that we have participants from various institutions, not merely from Malaysia, but also from abroad. Please introduce yourself through the chat box and enjoy this webinar. Before we start, I want to make a few announcements. All participants will be given a certificate and CPD points for USM staff. You just need to fill in our feedback form. The link will be given towards the end of our session. Meanwhile, at any time during the session, you can ask any question related to the topic today by typing Q-U-S-T-I-O-N followed by your question in the chat box. Next, our committee will compile them all and relevant questions will be brought forward to our speakers during the Q&A session. For your information, a recorded version of this webinar will be available and you can just go to YouTube or Facebook to view this webinar later. Now, we have come to our main agenda, whereby we are going to listen to the tips and guidance from our distinguished speakers. Uh, before that, let me introduce the first speaker. Um, Dr. Judith Dehan is a program manager of the Open Science Program at uh, Utrecht University. Okay, we also have our second speaker is Dr. Daphne Jensen. She is a research data consultant for research data management support. She supports researchers and students throughout the various stages of the research workflow. And she also the community manager for RDM support and the Utrecht data management community UDMC. And our last speaker, third speaker is Mr. Felix Weidema. He's a subject librarian veterinary medicine. He advises staff and students of the faculty on various aspects of scientific information such as open access, open science, RDM, fair data, systematic searching, and reference managers. He is also a project member of one of the open science research projects at uh, Utrecht University AS Review. Therefore, without further ado, I would like to call upon our first speaker, Dr. Judith Dehan, to proceed with her presentation entitled Introduction of Open Science Program at Utrecht University. Please welcome. Thank you very much, um, um, and thank you for inviting me here uh, to present something of the uh, Open Science Program. I'll share my screen right now. And you should be able to see uh, the presentation uh, mode right now. Is that correct? I can't see you anymore. Sorry. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Perfect. You, you can still see it now? Yes, I can see it, yeah. Okay. Oh, it says research data management, sorry. It it's not the correct one, yeah. I'm not sharing this one, so I don't know who is sharing it. The first one was okay. Uh, let me try it again. Now, share screen. 
Yes, right. Now it should be okay. Yes, open signs. This is the correct one. Yeah. Yes. Sorry for uh, for the technical issues, but uh, thank you very much. And I would love to tell you something about the open science program at Utrecht University. Uh, at Utrecht University, open science is at the core of the strategy of the university, and that's also why they started with an open science program in 2019 already. So we've been working on open science for a couple of years now. Um, and we do this together with uh, various groups. And uh, one of our, our um, uh, partners is, of course, the university library as well. So I know Felix and Daphne as, uh, uh, as two uh, uh, very lovely colleagues. So this is the uh, the infographic of our open science program, which kind of encapsulates what we're doing at U at the University of Utrecht. Um, as you can see here, we are moving from uh, a past where science and society was kind of separated and not working much together. And we want to work towards a future where science and society are uh, more interacting and working together to increase the impact of the research and education that we're doing. So as you can see here in the future, we want to increase the transparency of what we're doing. We want to increase impact, uh, have open access output uh, publications, but also uh, sharing data and code. Um, we want to cooperate instead of having a lot of competition, teamwork, and of course, involving society and this all for our mission to working together towards a better world. Uh, and at Utrecht University, we do this among others with the open science program. And we have five tracks now in this open science program consisting of open access, fair data and software, public engagement, recognition and rewards. And we lately added one track, which is called open education. And you see it here in this propeller because, of course, open education goes through all these different tracks, uh, as does research. But our main focus of the open science program started with the research part, and now we are incorporating open education as well. So a little bit in depth on the open science in education part, which we recently started, that consists of, uh, of four topics, actually. So we want to uh, incorporate the open science mindset in our curricula. So for master students, bachelor students, but also PhD students. Uh, so what is it? What is needed in this mindset to be open and transparent in the way that we work, both in uh, uh, the research part as in the education part. Also, for doing open science, you need specific skills. So what kind of skills do we need to incorporate in our education? Uh, for researchers and students to be able to actually work on an open science way. So think of um, making your data fair, um, research data management, um, interacting with the public. You might need some uh, different ways on communicating depending on what kind of stakeholders that you want to uh, work with. We have recognition and rewards to, to make this happen, we need to evaluate our academics or our staff in a different way so that they also feel that they are rewarded for the things that we are asking them to do. And not only for, for example, research output um, or the amount of money that people will uh, bring in with uh, applying for grants. So this is a very important part as well. Uh, and we have the open educational resources. So also in your education, you can share and you can open up the material that you use and be transparent and make it reusable for others. So public engagement is also uh, one of uh, the core uh, tracks of our open science program. And this, as they think, is something that is unique of Utrecht University as well, that we really say that the main goal of open science is to increase the impact that we have on society and on societal stakeholders. And we already had um, a lot going on on public engagement, such as science communication, working together with stakeholders. But uh, the interaction between the th different kind of public engagement uh, activities 
uh, can be aligned more to increase um, uh, the effect that we have with public engagement. So this is what the public engagement track is doing. Uh, they are aligning these different kind of public engagement activities, such as science communication, citizen science and stakeholder engagement to increase uh, the so society and science interaction. And for all uh, of this to uh, work, we need to change the recognition and rewards uh, system that we have at Utrecht uh, University, or actually um, it should be changed uh, in the whole scientific community to make open science work. Because what has happened in the last decades is that the primary focus of what we uh, recognize in rewards of individual uh, researchers is the research focus. So we mainly look at what people do on uh, their research track. And we look at output, mainly the quantity. So how many papers do you publish? Where do you publish? Is this a this an high impact journal? Or um, how does your age index increase by this publication? Of, or what is the amount of money that you um, apply for and actually get? And to actually make open science happen, we need to change this focus from this very quantity, quantity focused research output to a more quality-based output where we reward the openness of what we're doing, but also the societal relevance, the interactions that we have with societal stakeholders, um, whether people share their data uh, in a fair manner. It should be more on narrative, on narratives and on meaningful metrics instead of the metrics that we were using. And because we want to have the have the reward system in such a way that we do not only reward the research that people do, because as a university, you also have tasks on education, but also leadership uh, and professional performance. We also want to diversify uh, how people are rewarded. So not only the research focus anymore, but also on education, uh, on leadership, the impact that you have and on professional performance. And one of the examples uh, of this is, um, for example, patient care, when you work with a universal medical center, there people also have obligations to um, to take to for patient care. So that should be also incorporated in um, how we reward and recognize people. So at Utrecht University, we are now implementing this new system of recognizing and rewarding, and we call it the triple model, where you see the T stands for team effort, because you do not do this alone, and you work as a team in the university. So you should also look at how the team performs and what your role is within this team. The R stands for research. Uh, the L stands for leadership impact for the for the I and then professional performance. So that's why we call it the triple model. Um, and that's what we're implementing now to make open science work. And for more information on uh, what we're doing, I would like to uh, uh, point you to uh, our website, but also on Zenodo, we share a lot of our documents or you can follow us on Twitter. So thank you and I'm happy to take uh, questions later. Uh, I'm sure uh, we learn a lot from that. Um, as for USM, actually, we are still at the awareness level for implement open science initiative and RDM among our researchers. Okay, uh, so now let's uh, move to our second speaker, Dr. Daphne Jensen, to share with us about research data management support at Utrecht University. Over to you, Dr. Daphne. Good morning. Let me see if I can, yes, <laughs> share my slides with you. Good morning, all. Um, well, it's afternoon for you. It's morning for me, sorry. Um, I'm very happy to tell you a little bit more about how we organize research data management at Utrecht University. 
Um, and we are, of course, linked very closely to the Open Science Program. So very nice to hear about the program and then move on uh, to uh, uh, a little bit more practical information. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the organization of RDM support. So basically my team. Um, a little bit about the context of research data management at Utrecht University. And then I would like to zoom in on some services. And um, if there's enough time, I can give you a couple of practical examples of the questions that we get on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and I would be also curious to hear if this is uh, like um, your experiences or if it's very different from what you get. Um, so first of all, RDM support is a virtual team. Uh, the core members are both from the library and information and technology services. Um, we function as a front office for all research data management questions. So also questions about infrastructure and tools and services. And although we are a central service, we work closely together with the local services in the faculties. And uh, it's important to stress here, I think that we provide support, uh, but we do not enforce any policies. So it's, uh, we don't check if the researchers are ticking all the boxes uh, during their research. Um, our network, uh, so the, the, the bigger group of people that we work with, uh, consists of people in ranging from the corporate offices to uh, colleagues in the faculties, but also strategic themes and focus areas. So we have uh, data managers and data stewards uh, in the faculties, but also in specific focus areas or on, on specific projects. We work closely together, of course, with privacy officers, the research support offices, um, people from ethical review boards, legal affairs, uh, the data protection officer, information security officer. So although we are a concise team, there's a very big network of colleagues that we collaborate with. And as Ramla already mentioned, we also coordinate the Utrecht data management community. So we try to function as a, a knowledge hub on uh, research data management within uh, the university. So about the context that we are working in, um, Utrecht University, as all universities, I guess, have a, a code of conduct for scrupulous academic practice and integrity where, of course, research integrity um, uh, and reproducibility are stressed as very important. And out of that comes uh, a policy framework for research data management, which has been in effect since 2016. And I can give you a very brief summary of that. So each individual researcher is responsible to draw up a data management plan at the start of a research project. Data is to be stored in a structure that is suitable for long-term preservation. Uh, researchers are to provide metadata to make their data findable. Um, archived research data is to be made available for access and reuse in and outside the UU, of course, insofar as reasonably possible. Uh, data should be archived for a minimum of 10 years. And then uh, the faculty deans are responsible for the implementation and monitoring of the university policy framework. And also it says here for drawing up additional faculty guidelines. And this has been something uh, that it, it's evolving. Uh, it, it has been uh, worked on for the, the last couple of years. And some faculties have very elaborate additional guidelines and some don't. So um, there are big differences there. This is uh, just what we have to work with. And this sounds, of course, these, these, this uh, policy framework and what is needed uh, sounds very alike, the FAIR principle. So make your data findable, make it accessible, make it interoperable, and make it reusable. So we abide by these principles for all our services, and uh, thus uh, we follow the, the policy framework. So um, about our services, in a nutshell, uh, we offer consultancy and advice, both in person as uh, online. And uh, we have walk-in hours, as you can see in this picture. This is a recent development. Of course, this is uh, post-COVID. 
Um, we try to offer people uh, the opportunity to ask us questions with a very low threshold. Just walk in and ask whatever is on your mind. Uh, we offer a lot of training. Um, some of our trainings are still online. Others have been switching to face to face again. And our trainings are on the one hand about data management and on the other hand about uh, fair code and software. We review data management plans. Uh, we offer RDM tools and also information and, and practical support on these tools. And then uh, there's also the fact that the data managers and the research engineers can be embedded in research projects. So that's also a service uh, that we offer. So um, I've been talking quickly enough, so I have time for a couple of practical uh, examples of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which I think clarifies the type of questions that we deal with throughout the week. Um, very straightforward, we get a lot of questions by researchers who have been awarded a grant and who have to write a DMP, a data management plan. Um, we work with an online tool for that. Uh, it's a very elaborate template that people can fill out and we review uh, their data management plan and we can offer consultancy if, if needed. Sometimes it's very straightforward and of course, if people are working with sensitive data, sometimes they need a little bit more guidance. Um, second of all, uh, this is uh, uh, something uh, a bit more complicated. We also deal with research projects that are looking for storage for sometimes large amounts of data that has to be stored for longer than 10 years. Um, of course, it has to be stored in a fair manner, but sometimes people also ask us, we have to be able to splice the data, make it available for external researchers, but we also need advice on how to deal with data requests and issuance. And uh, this is something that we are working on and we are developing protocols for it, but uh, we're not there yet. This is uh, in development, of course, a storage solution we can easily offer, but um, the issuance is uh, a, a lot more complicated than that. We also get a lot of questions uh, from researchers um, working um, with sensitive data. For example, speech recordings, socioeconomic data, medical data, heart rate recordings, EEG recordings. And sometimes people ask for, for example, uh, can you look at our informed consent? Is it thorough enough? Can you give us a little bit of advice if everything is, is in order? And uh, of course, the, the, the first part of, of the question, we will answer ourselves and then we will call in probably a privacy officer or maybe a, somebody from information security to help us assess if everything is uh, in place. So it is September right now, and this is the start of the academic year for us in Utrecht. And we get a lot of questions uh, from lecturers saying, I'm teaching a course, mostly for research master students. And they feel they need a basic understanding of RDM to be able to conduct their own research, but most of the students don't know how to do this properly. So we are invited for a lot of guest lectures. And um, this is a very nice and also challenging thing to do because uh, uh, the researchers are easily convinced of, of course, uh, the, why RDM is useful for them as students are sometimes not so easily convinced, but uh, we try to make it as, as fun as possible. We also get very straightforward questions. For example, what tools are licensed within the university for a specific goal, for example, audio transcription. And um, sometimes we uh, notice that researchers are not happy with the tools that we offer. And then we try to get in contact with our colleagues from the information and technology services and try to see if it's possible to maybe license another tool or pilot another tool. So for example, that is what's happening now with audio transcription. We are piloting a new tool because the old one wasn't sufficient for most researchers. Um, we also get questions from researchers who work together with uh, third parties. 
And sometimes uh, this can be another research institution, but also, of course, uh, sometimes a commercial company. And um, they ask us, do we need a data transfer agreement for that? How does that work? Um, sometimes also, how, how do we transfer the data at all in a secure way? And uh, we also try to offer advice on that. And I'm, I must say, I'm always very happy if, if people approach us with these questions because it means that they are aware <laughs> that maybe something has to be arranged for, to do this in a, in a secure and proper manner. So I was very happy to get these questions. And then uh, last but not least, um, so the past year we've been getting a lot of questions also about uh, publishing software uh, and publishing software packages as fair as possible. And uh, of course we offer, for example, a reproducible coding training, um, but we also try to pe point people towards the university's GitHub instance. Um, but I think this is something that we have to develop more in the upcoming years to provide better support, to make it very co coherent and straightforward for people. Um, but this is, this is still a challenge for uh, the next year, I think. So these were my practical examples. Um, I already see some stuff popping up in the comments. Um, I will give uh, the floor to Felix, but I'm also available for questions afterwards. And uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, um, thank you very much to Dr. Daphne for such an insightful presentation. I believe you have learned a lot from the sharing session. Um, actually, from uh, USM, if I can share, actually, we are in the process to have our own um, USM open, uh, guidelines on open science soon. Uh, we are also in the process to have or to create our own data management plan and also to identify our infrastructure or storage uh, to keep our research data. Okay. Um, all right, so without further ado, uh, I would like to call upon our last speaker, uh, Mr. Felix uh, Weidema, to share about Open Science in Practice AS Review. Uh, please welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, salam and good afternoon. I'll uh, have a look to share my screen. Uh, yes. Um. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it myself, so that looks good. All right, so I'll, I'll uh, have one example, which is the AS Review pre project, but I've added two more. So three examples of open science at the university to see if we really practice what we all preach about open science. And the first example is that I just went to the UU corporate website and downloaded the presentation that's there. So that's what the UU board uh, offers to all UU members to include in their presentation. So it's called the corporate slide set. Uh, set and, and I checked if there's any slides on open science in there. And actually there are, there are many sli slides on open science and open science aspects in there. So that was a good sign that we are on the right track, not only with within the library and within the open science program, but also the most corporate part of our organization has open science included in the in the slide deck with all kinds of nice pictures and uh, numbers on how many students and how many uh, educational tracks we have. Uh, but this quote from the accompanying website says, open science calls for an open outlook, open attitude, and affects the relationship with science and so, with society. So that's what also was in the visual that was shown by my colleague Judith that we try to integrate science and society as much as possible. It also shows in how the research is uh, split up in uh, four strategic teams. And each of these teams tries to be more integrated than just the traditional faculties of uh, faculty of science and faculty of medicine. They try to be more integrated between the disciplines within research, but also have a link to uh, urgent uh, societal issues. So that's one of the other aspects that you really see in the in the corporate slides 
uh, that I think stands out uh, as one of the open science aspects. Public engagement, so reaching out to society. These are uh, two of more, uh, two of many examples here, uh, the, but also the ones I like most. It's the summer school junior, where in summer, when most of the students are uh, gone, either partying or studying elsewhere, uh, we invite uh, young uh, students from the area, from the region to explore the campus and do some uh, experiments and walk along with a student or a professor uh, during the summer. And the other way around, we send our professors to uh, the, the schools. Uh, mostly they travel by bike because yeah, in Utrecht and the Netherlands in general, we travel by bike a lot. And also our professors go in full, full costume on their bikes to the students in, uh, in local uh, elementary schools. So these are two examples uh, that really stand out uh, from the corporate uh, side. So these are more of the, the top-down examples of open science at Utrecht University. Now have a look at the library. How can we support the open science uh, program and the open science movement in general? And that is actually what we're doing now. So knowledge sharing either with these kinds of sessions for like an international audience and more locally, we do workshops, open science, a general introduction. Uh, this one is today, though this afternoon I have to do one uh, live in a, in, a, in a small room with coffee and cookies. I do a workshop for a general public, so anyone can sign up. And we have done this uh, for the last year, so mainly online during COVID, and now we're starting them to do live again. And it turns out that, that among the participants, there's a, a large percentage of what we call support staff. So people who advise on either data management or on grants or on privacy or on policy, because that's those areas, they are uh, seeing the, the what's happening in open science now, so that the, the grants need an open science aspect and in data, there's a lot of open science. So there's uh, where normal workshops are mostly for researchers, this workshops uh, attracts a lot of uh, research support staff as well. Um, and this general workshop, I try to summarize it in three slides. Uh, and it says open science for, and that can be like a general audience um, of, of students or researchers. And we dive into the definition of open science and we don't feed them this uh, crowded slide, but we uh, do this step by step and we say open science has three main pillars, open to reuse that goes on uh, publications and data, open to the world and open to participation. So we try to explain open science in the broadest sense because normally the focus for researchers is on open access of publications because that either costs money or it's uh, the journal doesn't allow open access or the focus is on open data uh, but we try to incorporate and show that open science is involved in the whole research workflow so this cycle of preparing for research um, discovery, what's out there, and analyzing, writing, and then publication is only one aspect of the whole science cycle as we see it. And of course, there's all kinds of shortcuts and interactions between these phases of the, of the research workflow. Um, and then we discuss open science practices. So more than just open data and open access, but we try to focus on the, the, yeah, the, the other the other parts as well and this is sort of a, a pick and choose menu where you can click one of the buttons and you'll get some additional information on this type of uh, of this open science practice um, this slide shows again how you can open up the the research workflow and it also demonstrates what i think why the library is always involved in these open science movements is that on the one hand, it's uh, it's a cultural change that researchers have to open up their work process and their thinking. And on the other hand, it's also a technical change. So you need a tool to, to 
to uh, facilitate you technically. So if you want to publish a preprint, you need to have a technical infrastructure that can uh, service you with, with preprints. So on the right, uh, right hand side, you'll see the icons of, of uh, products or tools or platforms that support these open science practices. And in some cases, they are really designed to be an open science platform. In other cases, it's more, um, it was there and it is being used in open science practices. So the open science movement to proceed, you need both technical solutions and you need a cultural change. And that, and that comes together, I think, in, the, in most of our library tasks. Um, well, the same workshop, we can also customize it. So there's like a button on the website, contact us. I think uh, uh, your colleague, uh, Mr. Musa, has also pushed the button and now we are here discussing it. Uh, so we customize the workshop for an audience and we focus on, in this case, open output and metrics. Uh, so those are two aspects from the library, these workshops and knowledge sharing that we actively do to uh, help open science further. Then the final uh, example, uh, Team Science, also already mentioned, is an AS Review project, an open research project. You see the slides here, asreview.nl. And uh, the main thing is the GitHub site, github.com slash asreview, where we collaborate uh, together. What do we do? We, I'm part of the project, of course, and we try to, uh, to speed up the process of systematic reviewing. Um, for the librarians among you, you may be familiar with systematic reviews. You end up with many, many papers doing a nice systematic search, and you want to filter to the papers either manually or with artificial intelligence. And AS Review is one of those tools that includes machine learning in the selection process. And here you see zoomed in the whole systematic review project where you find uh, items which are systematic search and you have to screen the relevant studies. And you can do it either manually or with software. And AS Review is one of the software tools out there that can help you there. And yeah, it's a really uh, an, an integrated team of experts from Utrecht University. And it's really open in the sense that I'm involved as one of the information specialists. And the, the, the principal investigator, the professor Rens van der Schoot in the top left, he has uh, asked the information specialists and researchers, yeah, would you like to be involved? And you can tell me anything you like. If it's, uh, if it's something bad or something good, we need your help and you'll, you'll be fully involved. Um, you're fully a part of the project and it's really a team effort that we take this tool uh, to the next level. So I really like that open aspect of it. And here you see the visual. We have developed a tool, but it's not a black box. It's a transparent box. And it is in line with all the FAIR principles. Everything you do is locked and registered. And once you push a button, it's fully reproducible and uh, in line with open science and open FAIR data uh, principles. And that's depicted by the, the Zen of ALAS, the electronic lab assistant, this uh, funny character. It's, uh, it's unbiased, open and transparent. Uh, and it's only an AI aided and interface with humans in the Oracle. So you keep in control of the tool itself. Um, these are some more links. I'll, uh, I'll share the slides afterwards. So you can click the links if you want to read more on uh, AS Review project. Uh, and it's an open project. You can uh, join on GitHub or ask questions there in the community uh, section as well. Um, that's it for now. These were my three examples. I'll stop sharing the screen and I think we'll then uh, continue to the Q&A. Thank you very much to Mr. Felix uh, for such an insightful presentation. I believe you have learned a lot from the three invited speakers today. So now uh, let us move to Q&A session. It seems that we have received a lot of questions from our participants. Um, let me read them one by one. The first question is from Ibn M. Ghazali. So the question is, is there any data man management plan standard you are using? So I think this is for Dr. Daphne. Uh, yes, uh, we have a standard DMP 
and uh, I must say it is almost uh, the same as uh, the Dutch Research Council is using, which is also almost the same as the one that the European Research Council is using, only it's, it's a bit more concise. Um, yes, so we have our own uh, standard, but it's uh, very alike the ones that the, the national and, uh, and European uh, founders request. Um, yeah, um, all right, so um, let's go to the second uh, question. It's from uh, Ikhwan Ismail, the librarian. So the question is, what RBM services does your library offer initially? Mm -hmm. What was your strategy in the beginning to develop RBM services? So I think this is to Mr. Felix. Uh, I can answer this, but it's more for, for Daphne, but... Um... I was involved in RDM in the beginning, so that maybe that's uh, the, 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 the person who asked the question knew that. Um, but in the beginning, RDM uh, a few years ago was a lot smaller, so we had, we had less people involved. And we really focused on what was needed at the moment, so what questions were coming in. And then we follow, um, again, the, the, the funding agency. So if the funding agencies start to demand uh, data management plans, then you see them coming in from researchers as well. Uh, so the, the beginning was the focus was on these RDM uh, DMP plans. Um, and soon that became too much. So we need to expand the team and set up a better structure also within the faculties and not everything has to be centralized. So that's how we developed uh, the RDM services in the in the beginning. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Felix, to, to add a little bit, uh, for the data management plan, is that compulsory for all the researchers, including students, to, to fill it? No, uh, depending on where you get the funding. So if they get funding from our national funder, it is mandatory. If they get funding from the European funder, it's also mandatory. But there are some, some ways you get funding uh, when it's not mandatory. So there are there are still research projects starting without the DMP, but the majority, it's mandatory because the funder requires a DMP uh, prior to the project start. Yes, it's clear. Thank you, Mr. Felix. Okay. So next, the third question is from Mrs. Adeline Sophia Ho. What is major steps to be taken to promote open science practices? So I think this is to Dr. Judith. So the next steps for uh, open science rights. Yes, so I think um, depending uh, on um, uh, on which place you are, but at Utrecht University, I think um, for us, the next steps are the education part. So really educating the new generation on open science um, and taking along also um, both support staff and academic staff and the movement of open science. So also for the recognition and rewards part. Um, so really to incorporate in this, this in the, in the, in our DNA structure that open science is the way of working. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Judith. The next question is, uh, to Mr. Felix, Kate, and this is from uh, Mr. Ibnu M. Ghazali. So the question is, is a public engagement project similar to citizen science? Um, well, it's part of uh, part of public engagement. So we see public engagement as there was also a visual, visual on public engagement where public engagement is everything where you try to involve the public with your with your, with your research and citizen science is often seen as uh, citizens, so non-scientists in actively involved in a research project, either by collecting data uh, mm -hmm. for a research project. Uh, common examples are in, in the biology or ecology, when people see a bird, they can log it in a website. And in the end, you have a, a database of, uh, of observations that can be used for research as well. So citizen science is a part of the activities that fall, fall, fall under public uh, engagement. Yes, um, I think it's clear. 
Thank you, Mr. Felix. Okay, the next question is to Dr. Daphne. So it is from D. Lao Lala. So the question is, is there any data steward or librarian will verify the metadata for research data? This is a, a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, we do see the need to uh, verify metadata and sometimes uh, also uh, add and enrich the metadata. It's not a service that we provide right now. Sometimes uh, research projects have their own data steward and they mm -hmm. uh, ask this person to, to uh, engage specifically with the metadata, but it's not a service that we uh, provide centrally. But it's something that we are looking into, of course, because as librarians, we are, uh, on the one hand, we are very uh, uh, enthusiastic about right, the right metadata. And on the other hand, we are not the specialists, of course, that those are the researchers. So it's, um, we're still thinking about it. Okay. Um, um... Dr. Daphne, if I can uh, ask a little bit about this, uh, about the data steward in Utrecht University, uh, who actually involved or appointed as a data steward? Oh, that, that very much depends. Um, yeah. This can be, um, for example, uh, a PhD student or a postdoc within a research project I that see. is appointed to have that role for that specific project. Um, mm -hmm. But we also, for example, in the Faculty of Geosciences, we have data stewards um, for uh, a specific division. So they assist multiple projects. And right. it's, just, it's not a role that we have centrally. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Daphne. All right. So next question is still for Dr. Daphne. The question is from Dr. Upasana Yadav. Okay. So the question is, how data can be visualized in a better way for the research paper? This is a question I cannot answer. Um, I think um, we get questions about this to get assistance. And I think um, that, again, in, for example, the Faculty of Geosciences, uh, the data stewards can assist in uh, visualizations. This is not something that we do right now. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is is in your area of expertise, Felix? Is there anything going on with data visualization? Well, yes. In the we have a course on on working with R, uh, R in Python, and we have uh, a coming up a, an R cafe or a programming cafe, and a large part of uh, of the questions there is on the visualization of data. So R is mainly used to analyze data and um, Usually, the next step is to visualize it in in, in an attractive and uh, transparent way with uh, the correct uh, uh, margins and the correct uh, the correct visual for the correct type of data. So that's included in the the R course and the R uh, R in Python programming cafe. But it's not it's not a service. So it's uh, we inform and advise, but we don't offer it as a service. Uh, to all research just because it's uh, there are too many researchers and too few data stewards and data consultants at this point. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daphne and also Mr. Felix. So the next question is mis from Mr. Muhammad Faris is one. The question is out of the six principles of open science, which one is the strongest area uh, at Utrecht University. I think this is for Dr. Judith. <laughs> I'm not uh, completely sure which uh, six principles um, um, he's referring to, but I think open access has been going on already for a really long time at, uh, at Utrecht. Uh, it was really pushed by the university library. So I think this is something that um, is going really, really well. Um, it's also not a question anymore whether people want to publish open access. It's more how do do they want to publish open access. So I think this is yeah. um, this is really uh, something that's going very well. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so um, yeah, so it's actually open open access uh, area is the strongest um, area of uh, open science at uh, Utrecht University. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Mrs. Uh, Adeline Sophia again. So the question is, what is the role of the library in the information ecosystem of open science and its development of that ecosystem? I think it is either Dr. Judith or Mr. Felix can answer this. Uh, yeah, I can, I can make a start maybe yeah. then. Uh, yeah, so I work for, uh, for the library and uh, as I said in one of the okay. slides that we, we have insight in the technical aspects of, 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 uh, of scientific information because of our history and current practice with metadata and organizing information, whether it's books or articles or other information sources that so we have a lot of experience in digital infrastructure and information uh, sciences and i think the library should really collaborate with the other uh, partners within the in the university so in this case the open science program uh, the university board and also the university technical the it department of the university because they have also a lot of expertise but their mo their their focus is mostly on safety security costs and uh, ease of use and i think that should yeah we should uh, combine all these uh, stakeholders into a decision on what infrastructure services or platforms we should acquire or or uh, or, or choose to to be used within the university and open science should be an aspect there as well yeah maybe i can add because i i agree with yeah, you're saying i think the 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 library has a very important role uh, in this information ecosystem for open science and at utrecht university also the open science program started at the library so and um people from the library work in the open science program and there are open science specialists at the library so this is very intertwined yeah yeah Okay, so um, thank you very much for the answer. I think we move to the next question from the same uh, person, Miss, uh, Mrs. Adeline Sophia Ho. So the question is about the library challenges for adopting open science practices. Uh, it is especially for those who are still young universities in research. So can Miss, I think Mr. Felix can answer this. Um. There are a lot of challenges and I think, uh, yeah. yeah, we want to share the good things and not the challenges, but uh, let's start to share the challenges as well. And I think to pick one open access is also a challenge because we, we try to go from subscriptions to open access, but of mm -hmm. course in open access, there's costs involved as well. And now researchers see invoices on their desk for the publication costs, whereas for years they have never seen the cost because the library paid pays all the subscriptions. And now with article processing charges, the invoices go to the researchers. So in some cases there are uh, yeah, interesting conversations, discussions, um, talks. Um, so that's one of the challenges that we have to explain how it was done for years and it's still done that we pay subscriptions and that we now want to lose the subscriptions, but there's still costs involved and they go to the researchers directly. So that is, the challenge that comes to mind uh, quickly to me. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Felix. So I think now we are taking uh, the last question from Mr. Yu Zengfu. So the question is how to do subject service in an academic university? So again to Mr. Felix. Um, I'm not sure what subject service is but yeah, my my title is subject specialist at the university so maybe it's about okay. servicing a, 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 some a, a particular discipline within the university um, so my main topic within the university is the veterinary medicine which is quite a specific topic but um, again one of the strengths of the library is that i talk to all my colleagues from the other disciplines so that we can share our knowledge in one central place and then each go to their uh, subject fields, whether it's veterinary medicine or geosciences. So I think it really helps to uh, 
to work in a central library and, and share the best practices among each other and then go back to your subject specialist field. I'm not still not sure if I'm answering the question, but I hope it's, uh, it's helpful anyway. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Felix. Uh, I hope it is uh, answer Mr. Yu uh, question from Mr. Yu. Okay, so uh, we are taking one one more question. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. So this is from uh, Mr. Ikhwan Ismail again. So the question is: How do the librarians at your university develop their RDM specific skills and knowledge? So either to Mr. Felix or the, Dr. Daphne to answer this question. I can start I think, yeah right. and then you can uh, add up to it i think um mm -hmm. this is of course interesting because there is no uh, specific training that is that is offered uh, for this i think um a lot of us do take the uh, rdmla course an online course um and um, what we do is that my team organizes i think twice a year a session uh, about how RDM is organized within the university and what the policies are and what tools we offer at that moment. And we invite all new colleagues that work on research data management. And this is, yeah, it starts out with us presenting and then it turns into this uh, knowledge exchange session, mostly because, uh, of course, a lot of the things we don't know ourselves and some other people do. And then uh, we try to build upon that. Um, but mostly I must say it's learning on the job. And I would like to uh, look at Felix and, and s see if, if that's your experience as well, that a lot of the things you just find out as you go along. Yeah, correctly. Uh, I think RDM is in development uh, for a few years now. And it, yeah, it really, you see that uh, both the funders are looking at each other and looking at libraries. So we, it, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's really helpful to, uh, share knowledge and to uh, talk to each other what's happening because it's not everything is set in stone uh, yet yeah. but there are some great resources online as well in uh, in data support courses and that that helps a lot as well of course yeah. yes um thank you mr felix and uh, dr daphne um we would like to apologize for not being able to answer all your, all your questions due to the limitation of time available. I think we have come to the end of uh, our webinar. Again, on behalf of the organizing committee at USM Library, we would like to express our fullest thanks to all viewers, especially to our speakers for spending your valuable time with all of us this afternoon. We want to apologize as well for any inconvenience during this session. Before we end, don't forget to fill in our feedback form to get e-certificate and CPD points for USM staff. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our, uh, our Facebook page for the latest updates and upcoming events. With that note, thank you once again and see you next time. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Wassalam.